In this lesson, we'll be looking at proofs that involve existence, such as examples and counterexamples. To start off, let's prove an existential statement. Remember this symbol here is the existential quantifier and is read, there exists. For the statement there exists an x that's an element of the universe, such that p of x, all we need to do to prove that the statement is true is find some value x such that p of x is true. The idea is that an existential statement is true so long as we can find some value that does the trick. Let's start off with an example. We want to prove the statement that there are sets a and b such that the cardinality of a union b is less than the cardinality of a plus the cardinality of b. Let's start playing around with this and see what we can figure out. At the moment, we don't want to write our proof to have all of our attempts. We just want to get some sort of idea of what works. If we can figure out what works, then we can write a nice, clean, formal proof. But let's start playing around with this. You might first start out by just writing some random sets, such as maybe 1, 2, and maybe we'll try 3, 4. Well, then what does that mean? Remember, A union B is basically the bringing together of the two sets. If it's in at least one of the sets, then it's in the union. The union here would be all four elements. Now let's try it out. The cardinality of A union B is four. The cardinality of B is two, and the cardinality of A is two. It seems that that just didn't work. The cardinality of A union B is actually equal to the cardinality of A plus the cardinality of B. That's not what we want. We want to try to find some sort of sets so that the union is smaller than the sum of the two cardinalities. We might think a little bit more. What was it about this union that made it actually equal the sum of the two? This is the idea. You say one and two and three and four are disjoint sets. If your sets are disjoint, this is always going to happen that you add the two numbers together and get a value that is equal to their sum. If we want to find the sets that actually do this, let's look for sets that have a common element. Let's try this one. Let's try one, two again. But for B here, let's not make it three, four. Let's put a common element, say one with three. Now if I calculate A union B, you'll notice that one is in both sets, but that's okay. It's in at least one set. Two is in at least one set, and three is in at least one set. And check it out. We've got two, two, and three. This is going to solve the problem. So have we proven the statement? Well, not really. What we've done is we have found the existential values that we're looking for, but we have not written a formal proof. Let's do that on the next slide. Here's our formal statement. There are sets A and B such that the cardinality of A union B is less than the cardinality of A plus the cardinality of B. And here's our proof. We want to just simply state the sets that we just found on the last slide as a nice clean form of the proof. But we want to write our proof in good English. Every proof that we write should be nice. It should be clean. It should flow nicely. And that will be the goal of every single proof. It should look like good, clean English, as well as providing sound logic. Here's how we'll write this one. Consider the sets A equals the set of 1 and 2, and B equals the set of 1 and 3. Remember, these were the sets that we picked on the last slide. Now let's think about how are we going to write this proof nicely. We want to make a claim that the cardinality of A union B is less than the cardinality of A plus the cardinality of B. So to write this nicely, let's next state what the union is and then start talking about cardinalities. Again, I want to make my proof flow, so let me throw the word then in there and try to make it sound like each is just a step. Then a union B equals the set 1, 2, and 3. Now we've given the elements in A union B, let's start talking about cardinality. 
So, the cardinality of A equals two, the cardinality of B equals two, and the cardinality of A union B equals three. Now we've stated all of our numbers appropriately. Let's get to our conclusion. Since three is less than two plus two, which we're writing is equal to four, we have that the cardinality of A union B is less than the cardinality of A plus the cardinality of B as desired. Now every time we write a proof, we want to finish it with some sort of symbol or statement saying that we're finished. And the nicest way that I like to do that is with this little black box that I put at the end of every single proof. This finishes the proof. It's clean, it's thorough, and it picks up every detail that we need. And it also satisfies that we have proven something because we have given the sets A and B that give this statement that we're looking for, that the cardinality of A union B is less than the cardinality of A plus the cardinality of B. The next idea that we want to look at is how do we disprove a particular statement, the universal statement, for all x that are elements of U, P of x. The for all, the universal quantifier, means that in order for this statement to be true, we need P of x to be true for every single x in this universal set. So how do we disprove it? Remember that the negation of this type of statement is that there exists an x in the universe such that the negation of P of x is true. In other words, we're looking for one counterexample. We're finding some value of x in the universe so that P of x is actually false. We only need to find one. Let's disprove this statement. For all x in the real numbers, if x is less than four, then x squared is less than 16. That seems like a fairly natural statement to make. Most people without much training might just say, oh, I can square both sides and check it out. X squared is less than 16. But those of us who have done enough algebra that we know a little bit more about this know that this is not a true statement. We know that you can't just square both sides of an inequality and it work out. Let's find a value of x that does cause some problems. Let's start with just a simple example. x equals 3. Well, if x equals 3, then x squared is equal to 9, and that is less than 16. But remember, we're not trying to prove that the statement is true, we're trying to prove that it's false. So maybe a positive number isn't the way to go. What about zero? Then x squared equals zero. Well, that's less than 16 too. Okay, well, what about a negative number? What about maybe negative three? Then we get x squared is equal to nine, but that's still less than 16. We're getting closer, but you might be seeing the pattern here. Notice that when I used a negative number, I started rising again. If I use a bigger negative number, we'll get what we want. Now I could say negative four, and you might realize, oh wait, yeah, negative four squared is positive 16, and that's not less than 16, but for effect, I think I'm gonna go with negative five. I want it to be a nice, clear contradiction. X squared would be 25, and that is definitely not less than 16. We tried a few things and we finally found one. We were simply looking for a value that it was less than four like we desired, but it did not satisfy that the square was less than 16. What we have here is the number negative five is less than four. It satisfies P, but it also satisfies the negation of Q. That is this statement right here. P and negation of Q, which is the negation of P implies Q. Since we've just shown that there is some value that makes the negation true, that means the original statement is false for that value, and the universal statement is therefore false. We only needed to find one counterexample. Let's write down this formal proof. Here's our statement again. For all x in the reals, if x is less than four, then x squared is less than 16. You'll notice I'm calling this one a disproof this time, but we'll use some similar looking language. We'll start off by saying consider x equals negative five. 
And then we want to frame x equals negative five into the statement that we were given. The negative five is less than negative four, but x squared equals 25, which is not less than 16. Now we have basically written down the entire proof, but let's write down just a little bit more to make it flow clearly. Thus, there are values of x in the reals such that x is less than four, but x squared is greater than 16. Now technically the negation here would be greater than or equal to, but my point is made. We might then end with a simple statement. Hence, the original claim is false. And we'll put a little square at the end to finish off the proof. Let's review for a moment. One of the things that we'll do as we go through these styles of proof is summarizing the different styles as questions. And these questions are important things to be able to answer as you improve as a proof writer. The details of proofs can change depending on the proof, but the structure of what you should do for every proof is one that you want to have down. You always want to know the steps to take to even start how to do some of these proofs. Here's the first question. How do you prove a statement of the form, there exists an x in the universe such that p of x? What do you guys think? Here's the answer. You'll find an example of x in which p of x is true. Next question. How do you disprove a statement of the form, for all x in the universe, p of x. Go ahead and think about this one too. Here's your answer. Find a counterexample. That is, find an example of x in which p of x is false. 